A perfect way to illustrate the decorator pattern is a card game. For instance, if we're working on a CCG, we might have to implement a mechanism in which the player can augment a base card's powers with bonus cards stacked on top of each other. Another use case might be to implement a wardrobe system in which your players can decorate their armor with accessories to buff specific stats. The best way to understand the decorator is to implement it. So we're going to build a mini card game using this pattern. Let's get into it. Now, a decorator is a wrapper and it contains an instance of another class inside of it so that it can modify behavior when the inner class executes. This is useful when you need to modify behavior at runtime or extend a class that cannot otherwise be extended, such as a sealed class. Let's have a quick look at a class diagram for the cards. All the cards implement the iCard interface. Regular cards only have the play method, but the card decorators can be played or can decorate another card. We'll make a few concrete decorators just to see this in action. Here's a quick diagram of the other classes we're going to implement to control the actual gameplay for the cards. Each card instance in the game will have a controller, which references a card definition, and creates a card using a card factory. The drop zone will handle cards that are being played, and we'll have a card manager to keep track of which cards the user has selected and various behavior. So let's take a quick look at this scene here. I've got one battle card with the dragon on it. That'll be a base card. And then I have two decorator cards that confer bonuses, the fire card and a healing card. Now, all cards are going to implement the same interface, and we're just going to call that iCard. And so in this script, iCard really only needs one method. We're going to be able to play cards, and the cards will return their value as an integer. So let's create a base card. I'm going to call these battle cards. Battle cards cannot decorate other cards. They can't be stacked onto other cards. You can just play them. So they'll have a value, and we can construct them with that value, and then when we play, we just return the value. Let's make another type of card called the card decorator. Now a card decorator will be an abstract class and we'll extend it with some concrete behavior. So I'm gonna implement the missing members here and we're gonna make the class abstract and the play method virtual so that we can override these in concrete classes. Now a card decorator could potentially wrap another card and we might also want it to have its own value. So the value we can pass in through the card decorator constructor Whenever we make a new card decorator, we'll specify that. However, we're going to make an extra method on here called decorate. And decorate will accept a card that we're going to wrap with the decorator. And here's where we're going to see the power of the decorator. The decorator's play method is not only going to have its own value returned, but it's also going to return the value of its wrapped card being played. Now this play method is a little bit too verbose. Let's just use shorthand. We'll use the null conditional operator and the null coalescing operator. If the wrapped card is not null, play the wrapped card and return its value and the value of the decorator card. Otherwise, return only the value of the decorator card. I'm going to move these two card classes into their own files. Okay, now over in the card decorator, we can make a few concrete implementations. So a damage decorator could basically just implement the same functionality as the abstract class. We don't need anything special here. We'll just pass the constructor value down. Let's also make a slightly more complicated decorator, and we'll call it a health decorator. Now, when you play the health card, it can return the value of the base card if it's wrapping one, but it could also do something else like heal the player. So it could potentially take the value that you've set in the health decorator and use that value to heal your character. Just so that we can see the exact sequence of things happening and have a little bit of clarity in the console, let's add a couple debug statements here wherever we have a play method. So up to this point, we've only created an interface, an abstract class, and a few concrete C-sharp classes that represent value and behavior of cards. But we don't have a way to define or create cards. So let's create an enum of our different card types that we can use in a scriptable object so that we can define many types of cards in the Unity editor. The definition could define the value and the type of the card. Now, potentially, you could add a lot more information in here, like the, the image on the card and different icons on the card and whatnot. But let's keep it simple for now. Since it's a scriptable object, we've got to put that into its own class. Let's move the enum over there as well. Add a create asset menu for this. Now, here in this class, we might as well create a public static factory. The factory can accept a definition and will give us back the concrete version of the card that we want. So I'll make a static class. It will have one public static method, create, accepts the definition, and then depending on the type, return a different type of card. Now, 
Copilot almost has this correct, but I don't ever want to return a null. So let's make the default return a battle card. That looks pretty good. We can access this card factory from anywhere and just send it a definition. We're going to get a value object back. So we're almost there, but we haven't created any mono behaviors so that we can link everything up together in the editor. So what I think we'll do is make a new class, a new mono behavior called card controller. Now, like scriptable objects, we need to put this into its own file. And card controller primarily needs to know a card definition. And we'll link a few other things up in here too. And I'm going to add the Odin inspector required tag here because we really need to have a definition for every single card that's instanced in the game. Now, once we have a card, we can store it in a variable of type iCard. And we can just call the card factory on the awake method to get that card based on the definition. So for now, that's about all we need to just hook everything up in the inspector. So let's jump back into Unity and start setting things up. You can hit Control R if you don't have your assets refreshing automatically. I'm going to jump into a prefab I made already, which has a parent and then the visuals as a child object. Now, these card templates I'm using are from the asset store, and I have to say I'm very impressed. If you're making a card game that needs some cards, check these templates out. I'll put a link in the description. Okay, so I've added our card controller to the card, and you can see Odin is prompting me to supply a definition. Now, I don't think this should be really called battle card because it's really a, the base prefab for all cards. So I'm going to come out of there and actually rename the prefab just to be card. Then I'm going to make a new folder here just to store all my card definitions. And inside of there, I can just start making, I'll make one base definition here. Uh, we can call this one, let's start with a dragon card. So a dragon card, let's say value 20 type battle. Let's duplicate this card and let's make a fire card next. So the fire card could be a damage card for, let's say five. And then let's duplicate this card and we'll call this one health card. Now health card, actually, you know what? I'm gonna call these decorator, fire decorator and health decorator. That'll be a little bit easier to read in here. So this can be a health card and let's make it a little bigger, maybe 30. Okay, with that done, let's jump over to each card and make sure that they have references to the various card definitions that we had. So dragon card gets the dragon card definition, of course. And let's do the other two. And then I think maybe we could even make one more type here just to put on our base prefab that could just be a, a do nothing card. So. I'll just duplicate my dragon card here and I'll call this one blank card and it'll just have a value of zero and I'll jump back into my prefab here and I'll set that on the base card. So any future prefabs that we make from this will just start with the blank. Okay, just going to check on my cards. References looking good. So now we need some play mechanics to actually see this happening. So what I'm going to do is make another class called drop zone. Drop zone will play a card whenever we drop it onto that area. In a moment, I'm going to create a card manager that'll keep track of which card the player has actually selected. And if they click on the drop zone and they have selected a card, we're going to play that card. So let's make a card manager singleton that will keep track of which card the player has actually selected. So I'm going to implement a generic singleton that I have from my own library, which we'll look at in just a second. But it just needs, for now, a reference to our selected card. It'll handle some other logic too in a second. Let's take a look at this singleton quickly. Now, uh, this isn't a video about singletons, but just in case anyone's curious. So using a singleton generic type here just cuts away all the boilerplate. In the future, I'll do another video about singletons, persistent singletons, humble singletons, and all of that. But for now, let's get back to our card manager and our card controller. So our card controller also needs to do some things when we're clicking. If we're clicking on any card and the user hasn't selected a card yet, then let's make the card that was just clicked the selected card. Otherwise, it means we've already chosen one card and now we're clicking a second one. So we're going to decorate the second one with the first one. We'll make a method on the card manager to handle that. So the generic singleton is a mono behavior, so I'm going to move it into its own file and the drop zone as well. So now in the card manager, what are we going to do when we want to decorate a card? Well, First of all, let's use pattern matching to determine whether or not the card that the player has selected is a decorator or not. Now, if it is a decorator, let's store it in the variable decorator. Then we can call its decorate method and pass in the card that we're going to wrap. Finally, the card that we just clicked will now contain the decorator, which in turn contains the original card. 
So effectively now, the card that we just clicked now contains the decorator, which in turn contains the card that this controller originally referenced. Finally, I'm going to add one more defensive check here. A uh, card probably shouldn't decorate itself, so if that's happening, let's just return out of here. I'm going to change the access of our card here just to get rid of this red squiggly for now. We can turn that into a setter method in the future. So while we're over here, why don't we write a few little animation moves so we can slide our cards around and make it look half decent. I'm just going to use do tween for this. So let's have a move to method that basically will just move from one place to the other with a little bit of easing. And let's have a move and destroy method. So if we're actually going to get rid of the card, then we can have an on complete that will destroy the card and potentially have some effects. I think, yeah, let's add some effects here. We can just instantiate some kind of prefab and, you know, rate on the card, really. And then we can destroy that after, let's say, one second. No, nice and simple for now. Let's make fields for all of these things. Yeah, okay, that all looks good. We'll just, uh, I'll pick a prefab particle effect to, to do for that. So, okay, with that out of the way, okay, let's add just a few more little quality of life things here. So. Let's suppose the player has decorated a card. Let's make sure that there is now no selected card at all, ready for a new selection. Because over in the decorate method, let's move and destroy the card that is doing the decorating. I'm also going to rename this card control. Let's call it clicked card. I think that makes a little bit more sense. Also, we might as well make use of the debug log warning method instead of just logs for, for strange little errors that we might encounter. Okay, let's jump back over to our drop zone. So if somebody clicks on the drop zone and we have a card selected, we should actually animate that. Let's move it over there, then we can play it. Okay, there's just one more logical path I want to consider during this video, and that is what if the decorator contains another decorator instead of a battle card? Now be careful here, because if you mistakenly call the decorator method on itself, you'll get an infinite recursive call that will result in a stack overflow. Now there's some defensive measures we can take to make sure we never let that happen, other than just our careful typing, and that is the reference equals method could check if one object is the same as the other, and we could throw an exception, or we might just want to log a warning or an error here and let the game continue. But this sort of error would indicate a major flaw in our logic. Why don't we see this in action? I'll recompile the code and press play here. So first of all, I'm gonna click them one by one and just watch the console there. So our health card had a message with 30, the fire card five, and the battle card with 20. So that's exactly what we expect. Let's run it again, but decorate our battle card with the fire card and play that one. There we go. We see both messages for the cards in the console, and we can still play the health card all by itself. So that's working fine. Let's play it again. What if we decorate fire with health and then take that one by itself? You see we get the health message and the damage card, and then we can play the battle card by itself. All right, so one more test to do, and that would be to stack all three cards onto one. So I can stack the health card onto the fire and the fire card onto the dragon. And there we go. We have all three messages in the console. So that's just about it. I mean, we can see that the decorator pattern is working, but what's the real power of the decorator? We've got all these nested decorators wrapping each other up. In a real game, the player would have to make choices about which order to stack cards in in order to get the most benefit. And the way that we can see that is by actually calculating the total of all these cards. Let's jump back into code and make a couple changes. First of all, let's store the total of all of these cards being played in a variable, and we can output that to see it. And then just to show the cascading effect of these cards being played, let's change the damage decorator for now to actually double the damage of whatever card it's wrapping. There we go. I'll recompile and play again. Now, if I were to play the fire card onto the dragon card, that should double the card's damage. So there we go, we have a total of 40, which is exactly what we expect. Okay, that was a lot going on in one video. <laughs> in the interface, abstract class, quick peek at the generic singleton. What else, static factory, decorator pattern, of course. And we even looked at the reference equals method. If you learned something new today, hit that like button and consider subscribing to the channel. New videos every week. If you want to dive into another topic, click on one of these boxes, and I'll see you there.